Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States. Episode 3.34, A Turning of the Tides. 1758 had once again gotten off to a rough start. For all the reforms and changes of the previous winter and spring, the results had been more of the same. Once again, the British found themselves on the wrong side of a one-sided loss to the French, most recently at Fort Corralin. The original plan had called for a two-pronged attack on Canada. To the south, it would be Abercrombie first capturing Fort Corralin, then Crown Point, and finally making his way through the Richelieu River Valley and on into the St. Lawrence. From the north, it would be Jeffrey Amherst, first moving on Lewisburg and then making his way into the St. Lawrence himself. From there, both Amherst and Abercrombie would move jointly into the Canadian heartland for the big prizes, Quebec and Montreal. There was, of course, much cause for hope as well. The British had a giant army, the largest in the history of North America, giving them a staggering numerical advantage over their French counterparts. They had far better cohesion with the colonies because of Pitt's subsidy system. However, despite all of that, Abercrombie and his army of 16,000 found themselves hastily retreating from Montcalm and his 3,500 defenders at Fort Corralin. It was therefore up to Amherst to turn the tide of the war and finally get things going back in the right direction for the British. Now before we move on, I want to make a quick note about the timeline here. The attack on Fort Corralin by Abercrombie actually takes place in the middle of the events that we are talking about today. So, just know that when the attack on Lewisburg begins, nothing had yet happened at Corralin. However, by the time that events wrap up up in Lewisburg, Abercrombie and company had already been forced to flee back away from Fort Corralin. For Amherst, getting things going back in the right direction meant capturing Lewisburg and thus securing the entrance to the St. Lawrence River, a river that gives access directly into the Canadian heartland. The previous year, it had been Loudoun who had set out on the exact same mission. However, delays and a stronger-than-expected French naval presence meant that the expedition stalled out in Halifax, before everybody decided that this was a pretty bad idea and turned back. This, combined with the attack on Fort William Henry, spelled the end of the road for Loudoun. From the British perspective, Lewisburg must have seemed like a pretty attainable target. After all, in 1745, the New England colonists had successfully captured Lewisburg themselves. Now Amherst was going to try his luck at it, with a giant army in tow. Strategically, Lewisburg was always a predictable target for the British, something that the French were totally aware of. As I said a moment ago, it is near the entrance to the Gulf of St. Lawrence and had a large natural harbor. On the approach to said natural harbor was a series of islands, ideal for installing defensive batteries to repel any would-be attempts at an invasion. So it was a pretty defensible position for the French, though nobody was really going to feel completely safe there given the fact that the colonial troops had captured the fort just a decade earlier. Though Amherst himself was running a bit behind, preparations were already well underway at Halifax. Recall that after Loudoun's failed expedition the previous year, he had left his men to winter at Halifax, where they remained. What followed was a massive preparation effort that saw men from all over the colonies shipped north to the staging area in Halifax, where, by the time the battle itself took place, some 13,000 men had amassed for the fight. The British had also launched a preemptive blockade in the spring of 1758, preventing further French reinforcements from reaching Louisbourg. The 13,000 men assembled were broken further down into three brigades. Command of these brigades were given to Brigadier General Edward Whitmore, Nova Scotia Governor Charles Lawrence, and Brigadier General James Wolfe. For the French, their best chance to stave off disaster was going to be preventing the British from being able to put Lewisburg under siege in the first place. Siegecraft during the 18th century was an absolute art form. To be sure, it was also a very effective way to fight, so long as outside relief did not arrive. Basically, here is how it goes. 
the group planning to lay siege gives the other side a chance to surrender, which, of course, they will never do. Trenches are then dug and the army drags artillery forward and then just blasts away the fortification. They move in subsequent waves, getting closer and closer to the fort as the defenses are worn down through the continued barrage. Eventually, after a few stressful days, the commander of the fort decides that he is not interested in being totally annihilated or starving to death, and goes ahead and surrenders. Ideally, he has held out long enough that any concerns over their honor and bravery are satisfied. We have seen this once already this season. One need only look a year earlier when it was Montcalm Lane's siege on Fort William Henry to get a sense of the proper etiquette in the situation. On June 2nd, Amherst arrived off Gabarus Bay. Gabarus Bay is positioned to the south of Lewisburg, some four miles away. The landing took longer than expected, as bad weather rolled in and made it much more difficult for the British to actually get their men onto dry ground. The French knew the dangers of getting caught up in a siege. Unsurprisingly, therefore, the best way that they could avoid this outcome was to repulse the British landing. Following the landing, the plan was that the main assault was going to come in three places. Wolfe was going to crash into the far western part of the French line. Lawrence would take the center, with Whitmore taking the furthest east point of the line. First, however, the British actually had to land. After days of bad weather which left the British lingering vulnerably off the coast, just outside the range of the French guns, on June 7th, things improved enough for the British to begin serious preparations for a landing. Amherst, to lessen the blow, sent troops along the entire French defensive lines in an attempt to keep everybody spread out. This would, at least in theory, force the French to thin themselves out as well, and would prevent an over-concentration of men in any one place. However, despite these efforts, there was going to be nothing easy about this landing. James Wolfe had scouted French defenses and realized that the proposed landing was a disaster in the making. Prior to the landing, Wolfe warned Amherst that the French were in a superior position, and that he was very worried at the prospect of being cut to pieces, making such a dangerous landing. Despite these warnings, however, Amherst wanted to get his men on the ground and get things moving. The shape of the landing area was roughly a crescent shape. Right as the British hit the shore, they would run immediately into a French abattis to slow their assault. Making matters worse, the French controlled the entire span of the landing field, meaning that when the British came into the zone, they would be susceptible to fire from both sides. Absolutely nothing about this is ideal. Amphibious landings are very risky in the best of times, and the French had a sound position that left the British extremely vulnerable to enemy fire. As for the French abattis, we saw last time just how effective those could be at slowing up in advance. To be fair, we are roughly a month before the battle at Fort Karelin that saw Abercrombie's men get tingled up in that abattis. However, where we stand on June 8th, the British are flirting with the prospect of another potentially devastating loss. We have been talking about the French and Indian War for a while now. Today is indeed our 10th episode on the topic. I would not blame you for thinking that things had gotten a bit formulaic. This is the part of the episode then when the British surge forward, suffer a serious loss at the hands of the French, and then after a day or two, they would fall all the way back to Halifax. This has pretty much been our story for the last several weeks. However, no. This time we will not see the British suffering another demoralizing loss. As the troops proceeded towards the landing site, the British Navy, under the command of Admiral Boscoin, opened fire to help soften up the French defenses, including that ominous abattis. Things started off poorly for the British when they first attempted their landing. As Wolfe had warned Amherst, the crescent shape of the bay meant that the landing infantry was caught in a dangerous crossfire. Sure enough, shortly after the initial attempts at landing, the British were seeing heavy casualties. This was, despite the French being in a strong defensive position, really about as good as it was going to get for them at any point on the 8th or beyond. <laughs> 
Wolf was forced back from the landing site, causing a delay serious enough that Amherst was forced to consider the possibility of calling for a retreat. Wolf, however, despite pulling back, did not go flying into an overall retreat, and instead relocated to a rocky point further to the east of his projected landing point. Here, the rocks provided sufficient cover for the landing British troops. Just like that, the British had established a beachhead. With the British having now secured a spot on the beach, Wolfe and his men started surprising the French defenders with attacks along their flanks. This proved to be enough to get the French to abandon their defenses and retreat into the relative safety of the fort. The British had captured Gabarus Bay and were now preparing for the main assault on Louisbourg itself. The French, by issuing such a hasty retreat, had helped keep both their own and, though not intentionally, British casualties down. Had the French maintained their position in the field longer, they could have caused serious problems. They were still in a suitable position, even after Wolfe had landed, and could have, at a minimum, made things very difficult for the British. Would they have been able to repulse the British back into the ocean? That's a bit more questionable. However, they could have made things much more miserable for those landing. With the British having landed, things progressed quickly to that standard system of siegecraft that we have talked about here before. The men quickly began digging trenches and moving ever closer to the French fortification. Amherst, understanding the game, went through the necessary maneuvers to ensure that everything remained honorable. Amherst let the French governor of Louisbourg, Augustine de Durcourt, know that he was going to be put under siege and that he should probably go ahead and surrender. Drucourt made these standard statements that he will never surrender, and he would fight until the death. With the British having dug their trenches and moved artillery within range of the fortification's walls, and Drucourt having declined the chance to surrender, on June 19th, the British proceeded to begin the process of blasting away the walls of Louisbourg. The only genuine hope for Louisbourg was that help would come from the outside to relieve them. However, by this point, the chance of relief was nothing more than a pipe dream for the French inside the fort. Earlier in 1758, there had indeed been French plans to help reinforce the fort. As we have talked about already, there really was no surprise that Louisbourg would be a target. It was a pretty obvious mark for the British to attempt to seize. Unfortunately for Drucourt and the French, there was no relief coming. Despite hopes that help was coming to save the fort, months before the British Navy had scored critical naval victories in the Mediterranean and in the Bay of Biscay. In both these situations, the French ships that had been intending to head across the Atlantic to reinforce Louisbourg had gotten caught up on the wrong side of losing battles. With French relief efforts stymied, Louisbourg was officially on its own. Practically speaking, with Louisbourg being relentlessly shelled by the British. The only question left to decide was exactly how much misery Drucourt was willing to endure before he inevitably surrendered the fort. Admiral Boscoen would help speed the process along as well. Boscoen had successfully blocked the Louisbourg harbor, trapping the modest French fleet inside. Throughout July, he worked diligently to reduce the fleet to splinters, and sent those splinters to the bottom of the harbor. Boscoen scored his biggest victory on July 25th, when he sent a landing party to board the Prudent, a 74-gun French ship of the line. The ship was promptly lit on fire and completely destroyed. A second boarding party went after the Bay of Fosson, the flagship of the squadron. Once more, the British captured it. However, this time, rather than burn it, they chose to keep it. The ship would spend the next half century as a British naval vessel that would, on occasion, engage in skirmishes with its original owners. By the end of July 25th, the French fleet at Louisbourg was either on fire, at the bottom of the harbor, or in the possession of the British. Back on land, all meaningful defenses for the fortress itself were gone. The British had just been blasting everything into rubble. It had been six weeks since the siege had begun, 
no relief was coming, and the walls of the fort were standing on little more than inertia. This, as it turns out, is about as much misery as Drocor was willing to endure. A truce was requested, and it was time to discuss terms. Drocor likely expected that the surrender would follow standard European convention. The British would grant terms that allowed the French to leave with an agreement that they would quit the fight. They would be permitted to keep their personal belongings, small arms, and maybe even a token cannon or two. They would be permitted to leave with their colors, in what they expected to be a civilized and honorable affair. This is how things were done. Recall, this is similar to what Montcalm had offered to the British back at Fort William Henry a year earlier. Except, that is not what happened. Amherst and the British had not forgotten about what had happened at William Henry. They had not forgotten Montcalm's suspected duplicity. The civilian population of Lewisburg would be permitted to keep their personal property. But that was it. The French soldiers would not receive a pardon. They would not retain their arms. There would be no token cannon. They were to be made prisoners of war and shipped back to Britain as bargaining chips for future prisoner exchanges. The civilian population, while allowed to maintain their personal property, was not going to be let off easily either. Nearly 8,000 French civilians were gathered up, put on ships, and deported back to France. Upon entering the city after the French accepted the British terms, what they found was a horrific sight, according to Admiral Bosquin's record of it. They were struck by the smell of burning and the stench of sewage and gangrene from the hospital. Most buildings had suffered from shot and shell. Barricades and shelters obstructed movement, and debris were scattered everywhere. Rotting tobacco lay on the quay. The harbor was littered with wreckage, the high water mark being delineated by the charred jet sam. The hulks of the warships burned on the 21st of July lay near the beach. The wreck of the Prudent were ironworking guns haphazardly among the blackened frames, smoldering near the grave battery. Small craft, many waterlogged or stove, were beached while broken spars rigging anchors, tobacco, and corpses moved in the swell. The town of Lewisburg, Lieutenant Henry Hamilton observed, was almost a heap of ruins. For the second time now, during the French and Indian War, we have seen the British undertake an effort to depopulate a region. The Lewisburg expulsion of 1758 included Lewisburg, but also Cape Breton Island and modern-day Prince Edward Island. This is to go along with the mass deportation and depopulation efforts from a few years earlier in Acadia. It is difficult not to connect the deportation of French civilians in Lewisburg to the deportation of the Acadians. Indeed, many of those in Lewisburg at the time were Acadians who had escaped the previous rounds of deportation. Geographically, it does appear that the British, both in London and in the colonies, had their eyes set on expansion into Nova Scotia. Historian Fred Anderson, whom I have relied upon pretty heavily throughout this entire series, has a different take on events, however. He points out that the expulsion of the Acadians in 1755 had been motivated by politics. Massachusetts and the other New England colonists were interested in the prospect of land speculation. However, the deportations we see in Lewisburg were more military in nature. Amherst was a lot of things, and we are going to talk in detail about his actions in the future. However, land speculation really does not appear to be towards the top of his list for reasons why he dealt so harshly with the French in 1758. Sure, the provincials and New England colonies were interested in land speculation. However, there really isn't anything to suggest that Amherst cared much about it. His first time having anything to do with the colonies is when he arrived just in time to move on Lewisburg. Therefore, his actions should be painted as more of a response to the overall strategy of winning the war. They were a direct response to the actions of Montcalm a year before. They likewise can be seen as being something of a proto-total war, as it expanded the belligerents from simply being military 
to including the civilian population as well. Though I would warn you all away from trying to equate the actions of Amherst in this case to somebody like William Sherman and his march to the sea during the Civil War. There is a pretty significant difference between the forced deportations under Amherst and modern concepts of total warfare. By the end of July 1758, Amherst had learned about Abercrombie's defeat at Fort Corralin. For Amherst, the pragmatic effect of this is that it brought a premature end to his ambitious plan for 1758. The British would proceed no further than Louisbourg. The combination of Abercrombie's loss, plus the fact that the French had held out far longer than expected at Louisbourg, stalled any hopes that Amherst still had for a strike into the Canadian heartland in 1758. He would spend the rest of the year in Louisbourg, shipping the civilian population to France and the military population to London. Beyond that, the British set out to turn the rubble of Louisbourg into a site sufficient to ride out the upcoming winter. With Louisbourg having been captured by the British and the French keeping their position at Fort Corralin, it would seem that this particular theater of the war was closed for the year. Next week, we are going to head back down to the south, to the war in Virginia and Pennsylvania. However, for this week, we actually have one more critical battle that I want to look at. To finish today, I want to return to Abercrombie, who is licking his wounds back at the ruins of Fort William Henry. It was, well, at this low point that Abercrombie met with John Bradstreet. Bradstreet brought with him an ambitious plan to try to capture Fort Frontenac. Fort Frontenac was a popular target, as it was a pivotal fort on the supply route. Capturing Frontenac meant cutting off the supply route for everything west of its location in modern-day Ontario. Beyond that, the fort was also a massive supply house loaded up with valuable furs. So, for the British, it would mean some pretty sizable plunder. Finally, the capture of Frontenac would essentially mean that the whole of Lake Ontario would be under British control. Bradstreet had been desperate to make this into a thing for a while. Having originally approached Lord Loudon, he offered to front the money for the mission out of his own pocket. Lord Loudon was impressed and sanctioned the expedition. However, when Loudon was sacked and the more cautious Abercrombie came into command, he decided to focus the New York troops on taking Fort Corralin. With the remainder of the North American army tied up with Amherst and Lewisburg, or to the south trying to capture Fort Duquesne, which, if you're curious, is the topic for our next episode, the cautious Abercrombie went ahead and cancelled all of Bradstreet's plans. William Pitt also left the Fort Frontenac mission out of his 1758 plans, so it's not exactly like this was a popular mission that Abercrombie was unilaterally scuttling. Nobody still in a leadership role was all that interested in Fort Frontenac. And just like that, the expedition to take the fort was dead on arrival. That is, however, right up until the moment that Abercrombie suffered a crushing loss at Fort Corralin. When Bradstreet arrived and pointed out to Abercrombie that there was still some time to move on Frontenac, he found a man that was a whole lot more desperate to salvage literally anything from the disastrous expedition against Corralin. Desperate to do anything to repair his reputation, Abercrombie went ahead and approved the mission and dispatched Bradstreet along with 5,000 provincials, 184 regulars, and some 70 Iroquois warriors to move against the fort. John Bradstreet was the 44-year-old son of a lieutenant in the British Army and an Acadian mother. Bradstreet was no stranger to military service, and had grown up in his father's army regiment. Now, if the name John Bradstreet sounds familiar to you, it's because today is not the first time that we have run into him. The first time that we met Bradstreet was way back in episode 3.23, when he had been a young man who was captured and held at Lewisburg. It was Bradstreet, along with William Vaughn, that in 1744 convinced William Shirley that they should make a move on Lewisburg, an expedition that was ultimately successful. Though I did not mention his name at the time, Bradstreet was also the man left behind at Oswego after Shirley's failed attempt on Fort Niagara 
It had been Bradstreet who had successfully kept the supplies flowing in Oswego throughout that winter. When Lord Loudon had come and taken over and taken command from Shirley, he quickly recognized that Bradstreet made a lot of good points about the need to improve supply lines, which would become one of the most significant contributions that Loudon would make in the war effort. Not wanting to tip off the French to the real plan, Bradstreet framed this expedition as a mission to the Great Carrying Place to re-establish a British foothold that was lost with the fall of Fort Oswego. The Great Carrying Place was located in modern-day Rome, New York, just to the northwest of Utica. The Great Carrying Place was a critical trading area for the Iroquois. Unsurprisingly, the prospect of a new fort at this critical junction was pretty well received by the Iroquois. Upon arrival at the Great Carrying Place, Bradstreet let his actual plans be known. His plan was to move on Fort Frontenac. For a good number of the Indian warriors, this was all that they needed to hear before they noped out. They had no interest in attacking a fortified position. Bradstreet, likely a bit annoyed, would end up leaving 2,000 men back at the carrying place to build the fort under the command of Brigadier General John Stanwix, who the fort would be named for. Bradstreet and the remainder would continue moving towards Frontenac. What would follow for Bradstreet is an impressive feat of stealth. By August 21st, Bradstreet had established his camp at the ruins of Oswego. To give a sense of the geography we are talking about here, Oswego is located roughly due south of Frontenac with Lake Ontario in the middle. Bradstreet was able to cross the lake and ended up getting within a mile of the fort before the French realized that something was up and frantically started firing on the British. By the time that the French had figured out what was going on, it was already too late. Bradstreet and his men quickly had seized a hill within 150 yards of the northwestern wall of the fort. During the early morning hours of August 27th, Bradstreet opened up his artillery barrage and started the process of blasting away at the walls of Fort Frontenac. And that's it. That is the entire story. The battle was short, and within two hours of the bombardment beginning, the French informed the British that they had had enough fun for one day. The French quickly surrendered the fort, with Bradstreet and his men moving in to collect as much as they could. Concerned that French reinforcements might eventually arrive, Bradstreet decided against trying to hold Frontenac. After he and his men collected all that they could carry, they used the substantial amounts of gunpowder stored within the fort to blow the entire thing up. By August 28th, Frontenac was a burning pile of rubble, and Bradstreet and company were moving back across Lake Ontario towards Oswego. Okay, so what gives? How did Bradstreet manage to get within 250 yards of Frontenac and then capture such a critical linchpin of the French supply lines all within two hours? As it turns out, there was nobody actually at the fort. Seriously, the French only had about 110 men to defend the fort. The vast majority of those in the fort were women and children, largely the families of the men who had been sent north to help defend Karelin. Therefore, although Frontenac was rather well armed, they simply did not have the manpower necessary to hold the fort. This likewise means that they lacked the numbers to have scouting parties that would have clued them in quicker to the fact that the British were rapidly approaching. The northern theater of the war was a mixed bag in 1758. The loss at Karelin was a crushing setback for the British. It completely upended their plans for the year and meant that, for at least one more year, the French would stave off a massive British army. At Louisbourg, the British had seized the critical fort and therefore controlled the all-important entrance to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Even there, however, the French had held out long enough to buy themselves time. The British walked into the year with ambitious plans, and while they had secured critical victories for the first time in years, it would take at least another year before the British could move on their ultimate targets of Quebec and Montreal. The year's events would also lead to yet another personnel change for the British. Back in London, William Pitt was not thrilled by the fact that Abercrombie's 16,000-man army had just been chased away by some 3,500 French defenders. 
Conveniently for Pitt, he had a successful commander already in place in North America, in Jeffrey Amherst. And just like that, Abercrombie had joined the likes of Braddock, Shirley, and Loudon before him, becoming yet another former commander of the North American British Army. The British would likewise score one of the most unexpected victories of the year under Bradstreet. The victory not only brought the British a huge amount of material wealth, but also meant that the French supply lines to the west had effectively been severed. Though the British could not complete all of their goals of penetrating into the Canadian heartland, after years of crushing defeat after crushing defeat, it is difficult not to put 1758 in the win column for the British. While the fighting has lately seemed to be contained in upstate New York and Nova Scotia, there remained battle lines drawn further south as well. We have not talked about events down at Fort Duquesne since back in episode 3.28. However, in 1758, that theater is also going to see a dramatic uptick in action. Next time, we are going to return to the south to the Ohio country, where this entire conflict began years ago, as the British attempt to purge out French influence once and for all. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you all back here next time as we return to the place where this all began. <laughs>